Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Crossover. Starring Josh Johnson and Chris McGill. Featuring Christina Thorson. And of course, you, the Instagram live chat. Now, sit back and enjoy this week's edition of The Crossover. Powered by Card Ladder. I saw him on the first. I didn't see him. He's not in my chat. Maybe I. He was. Blocked. He's not there now that I'm in, but when I before I joined, he was the top. All right. Well, I met Mohammed a week and a half ago or so. Nice. Two weeks ago. Yep, I, and then I blocked him after. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen enough. <laughs> he got close yes. enough. Have you ever done that? Met someone in person, went home and blocked them? <laughs> no, no, this is the first. Felt great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's see here. Welcome, everybody, to the crossover today is friday january 5th and we typically start this show if i remember correctly with any mail days that might have been had since the last show mm. no mail days but i got two cards in the pipe oh <laughs> nice nice yeah i don't have any oh i do have mail day actually uh i can't believe i forgot this um, I don't think I've shown this on the show yet. Yes. So, thanks to Tim, exquisite collector, for spotting this Nikola Jokic 2022 Optic Elite Dominators, one of one, gold vinyl. He saw it at the Macau show, uh, let me know about it, and then allowed me to make a deal through him and then he shipped it to me and it got here right away and cool card nice so one mail day and then my big big mail day is uh um it, it'll be here soon hopefully but before the next you show. put it in the request they ship it yet it is not shipped yet no. but yeah i'm working on it cool do you think a lot of people uh we haven't talked about the show the macau show do you think there was a lot of people making deals remotely and having stuff shipped. I don't know. Did you make any deals? No. I feel like, from what I heard, it was a lot of uh, deals in person. I didn't. I didn't hear much about the remote deals. Like, because I know National has a lot of that. You know, obviously, like being within the country. I don't know if it was like people less likely to do that. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm honestly the only person I'm aware of <laughs> that remotely made a deal through that show. I do know yep. that that show, though, has resulted in some new pipelines being opened up yep. of collectors on that half of the world now are funneling cards for sale through our big auction house. Yes. And you've probably seen a lot of those show up over the last month. Yeah. And there's been more um, communication between um, specific people in China that are reaching out to people here and like trying to set up some pipelines and trying to uh, get some deals going as middlemen, things like yes. that. Yes, 100%. Uh, the rumor was that there was a Michael Jordan, so some big, I won't say the specific cards, but some very big Michael Jordan cards available for the right price. But I don't think any deals were made. And I'm talking like above rubies and PMG red and stuff like that. Yeah. All right. What about, well, Christina, did you have a mail that you wanted to show off? No. What about announcements? Card ladder related announcements. Do we have any of those? No. Nope. Just on the grindstone, an uneventful close to Q4, knock on wood, and uh, into another Q, Q1. <laughs> All right. Let, let's get to some questions because there was a treasure trove of questions. The questions um, really made me laugh this week, and I've just, I kept the questions like uh, uh, spicy. You know, I, I just stuck with the, the questions with an edge. I kind of packed them at the front of the show. Uh, but first, let's take some lumps. 
So I have three comments here. Uh, one from Drake's PC. I thought every other question was like, what the hell's wrong with you guys? Why are we going <laughs> so long? So I thought one about like load management jokes. Yeah, here we go. All right. All right, here we go. So Drake's PC says, who takes off for load management more? The crossover or NBA players? So that's an open question. Uh, what are we doing here says, what can we expect after the long layoff? Rest or rust? What do you think about that? Uh, rest. Yes. So we're like the bye week teams in the NFL. We're going to come back rested, not rusty. And Doc Collects Card says, where's your doctor's note? You've been gone for way too long. Um, There's one about saying we're like the LeBron of load management, to which I say, so we're like third all time in minutes <laughs> and first in points. That's pretty good for load management. That's right. Respect our longevity. All right. Respect our longevity. Um, all right. Let's get to this next question here. So there were some Wemby topics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to do this one quickly here. So PLB card says, I think after last night, you need to spend some time on Victor Wembanyama. Of all the crazy things he did, he's referring to the nationally televised Bucks Spurs game. Did anyone else see him jump from the paint to contest a three pointer and actually seem to force a bad miss? Also, as far as I can tell, he has no cool cards at this point. Uh, he does a some five-figure cards, though. Um, <laughs> or at least nothing in a Spurs uniform. And then straight execution on a similar topic says, Victor Wembyama or Chet Holmgren, who do you think will have the better career? Mm. Yeah, the uh, I saw the – you sent me that five-figure Bowman green out of nine. Yeah. Those cards – I'm just gonna I'm just gonna call my shot. Those cards are going down big time <laughs> when the NBA cards start coming out. There is like a there is like one NBA card I've seen. It's like a silvery shiny one. It's like yeah. a national pack silver pack card. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This one. This is bad, dude. Come on. This is like non licensed stuff. How many times do we have to see this playbook? Yeah. So this is the uh, 2022 Bowman Chrome University. Prospects autographs uh, out of 99 green Wemby PSA 10 pop five sold for over $12,000 with golden in the weekly auction this week. Well, that's going to be proven silly. Do we, <laughs> you know, do you, do you know what releases we're coming up on? Is there anything? I, I know that like the football rookies are just now getting cards coming out. At the end of the season, is basketball going to be the I, same? I saw a reel from S. Blaise today that was complaining that there are not and there haven't been any new NBA products for a few weeks, and there won't be for a few weeks more. So they're dipping back into uh, previous year's products. I do know that when Benyama was in NBA hoops, and this yeah, this card sold with Golden a week ago. So this is uh, his one of his NBA Hoops base set rookies. He has two. This is not the first appearing base set card. This is the subset. But this is the artist proof black one of one. And it sold for about seven grand a week ago uh, with gold. How is that less than a green? I don't understand that. A one of one license sells for half as much as a unlicensed out of 99 green it doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. yeah i think that market because of the delay and because of fanatics's push to get into yeah. making a lot of wembenyama cards and heavily promoting their wembenyama cards and hold, holding the event and bringing wembenyama into that event and the breakers breaking the bomb and stuff and and promoting it a lot i think there's gonna be a lot of confusion in his market yeah um for a while <laughs> just kind of unfortunate but yeah, do we want to talk about just how bad the Spurs are? I think they're like five and twenty-eight. They they have some like spirited games when they're on national TV. It seems, or when they're playing good teams, they beat the Lakers, they beat the Suns, they played well against the Bucks. But overall, all like they're pretty terrible. I don't know what. They are. are we starting to question Popovich a little bit, like how bad they are? Yeah, well, they, 
They're five and twenty-nine, which is the second worst record in the league. Slightly better than the Pistons, who are three and thirty-one. And the Pistons take a lot of heat for sucking, but the Spurs suck just as much. Yeah, I mean it's basically the same thing. The Pistons just had that crazy losing streak, is why people focus more on them. Suck, right? And when Benyama, he's on a minutes restriction right now. It definitely seems like. The Spurs are tanking for a better pick. For what? What are they hoping to get? I don't know. Another pick, I guess. Bronny and LeBron. <laughs> Bronny? Yeah, Bronny's like, to get averaging like four points a game. I don't know. Now, when Yama's advanced stats, his PER is about 20. His true shooting percentage is 54. His box plus minus is one. Um, to have a positive box plus minus is good, especially as a rookie. Have a PR of 20 is pretty good for a rookie also. But I know Holmgren's numbers are a little bit better right now. Uh, who do you say is going to have the better career between Holmgren and Wemby Young? Better, better career? Mm-hmm. Career. This question usually comes down to, like, team winning. and it look, it, You know, obviously it looks like Chet is in a better team situation. The Thunder are, like, third fourth best record in the NBA right now. I think the Thunder are like fifth in offense or and third in defense. They have crazy crazy stats. Um and Wemba's a good uh, I mean uh, Chet has, has been a good Chet obviously in that team. I don't, but I still would probably say Wemby like he just has so much more upside I feel like he's like four inches taller, isn't he? <laughs> he's he's got a better shot, better hand better handles. He's he's good. Same Wemby also leads the league in blocks per game. Uh, yeah. That's something. All right. That's enough one Benny Yama talk for now. I mean, he's fun, um, but he's a frustrating watch right now. The team doesn't really feature him that much in the nice. offense. A lot of things look awkward and disjointed. He's on a minutes restriction, and the team gets its ass kicked every night. So. He played like 26 minutes in that Bucks game, I think I read. Yep. What the hell? It's like a big, big game, you know, versus Giannis. A lot of excitement. I did see – yeah, he had the, the alley-oop off the backboard to himself. There was another where he had a dunk and, like, Giannis was trailing the play. And Giannis looked like a short player. It just <laughs> is the – it's so – like, because Giannis is humongous, obviously. And he looks small compared to him. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's It kind of is a mind fuck. Yeah. All right. That's enough of women. Yeah, was still lots of season left still to see where things – Developed. All right. Christy Bucket says, how long do I need to hold on to a card before I sell it? <laughs> this is the one you have to sell eventually? Huh? What? Well, sorry. The implication being you have to eventually sell yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, I don't really know. Is this a, is this, is this a genuine question? No, this is the same guy who posts like he's getting a card and then puts for sale or for trade on the fucking story post. <laughs> right. Yeah, so this this question is like like what Josh was saying, like it's assumed that he's gonna sell the card, so how what's the polite waiting? For? Yeah. To so what? Like with the end game being like you don't want people mad at you that you're flipping it too quickly? Well, <laughs> Right, exactly. Well, like, okay, so before price tracking databases became an important aspect of the hobby, the polite waiting period was three months. And the reason for that is because that's how long it took for comps to flush out of eBay. Okay, so th- three months was the polite waiting period six, seven years ago. Now, uh, your comp is, is in there, and people can go see it. <laughs> Three months, six months, a year from now. So, uh, you know what, Chrissy Buckets, you can sell till your heart's content. Who's stopping you? Why? Who says you need to wait at all? The Brock Purdy True National Treasure Shield, a six-figure card, is is being held for less than two months before being resold on a major auction house. It's sold at the end of October, and it's up for sale again right now. A little bit more than two months, sorry. Uh, if a six-figure card only has a waiting period of two months, 
a player's best card or one of their best two or three cards, you, you don't have to worry about buckets. Yeah, I think there's two paths here. One is the path that I choose to take, which is I don't really buy cards thinking I'm ever going to sell them. It, it, it happens sometimes where I do sell because I'm getting different cards or you know things change, but I don't buy a card at the intention of like, I'm going to sell this quickly. It's either that path or the other path, which is like, who cares and sell it. You just don't worry about it. Just sell whatever you want. Buy it when you want. Do whatever you want. Yeah. Buy it. Next day, who cares? <laughs> Pooh Blue says, however many words long your Instagram post is, that's how many days you have to wait. Spinatron's <laughs> not allowed. Uh, the cell cards. Penetron is going to be waiting until the next life. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, it's more than just like a time span, too. It's also like what's, you know, people start to get a sense of the person yeah. and what they're up I think Whether they're just recycling through cards or, you know. The part, the part of this that always gets me is like when someone buys buys a card and they really talk it up like they're just so excited about it you know this is like the best thing i've ever had in my collection <laughs> and it's like dot 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 fs it's like okay well it's clearly like your marketing pitch you probably use chat gbt to come up with that just so you could sell it to us that's <laughs> nice oh we've got some other topics on that note that i'm gonna let us get to all right uh, this one from black hat cards says, is there a better way to lose money than breaking football prism boxes at $950 per box? Is there a better way to lose money? <laughs> a more efficient way? <laughs> I mean, I can think of more efficient ways to lose money, but, uh, yeah, people are getting hosed. Yeah. People are getting Posed on the on the brand, on the, especially on the big brand name products, it's just uh, it's tough out here to see an ROI in the plus. Because aren't the boxes? Correct me if I'm wrong here, but aren't the boxes and wax prices like pretty stable? But the singles prices are going down, so it's like something's got to give. You know, like they got to lower the price of the boxes, or the demand should lower, and people should stop buying into them because the you know, the margins don't make as much sense right. anymore. Yep. Nice comment there. Point point well taken. It's always good to just kind of, the price of, dude, a thousand dollars for a prison football box. Who can afford this stuff? You guys don't, know. don't break as much wax anymore, right? Did we not, we never break wax anymore. When those boxes were 100, 200 bucks, you know? That's just different, like... Different time. If I, if I was a Fanatics employee right now and I'm in this chat, I'm just taking note of stuff like this. This like you got people who love being in the hobby, broken wax historically a lot, and and we're not right now. Come on, like you should be incentivizing people to break wax that enjoy the cards that are bringing attention to it, that are talking about it on their shows, that are enjoying the cards they're getting at it that aren't worth you know ten percent of the, what they paid for the box, stuff like that. That that should be easy to solve, I think. Right. The problem is that the breakers are still buying the product at the release price. Yeah. Like, fractionalizing the box with pick your teams and random. <laughs> Christina blames the breakers. Shouldn't the well, demand the for the buying I'm saying there's still a portion of the hobby that is profiting off of these box prices and the sell that stops, then the mm. you're not going to see like collectors buying and breaking boxes again because it makes no sense for them to do it. Yeah. Like, I miss ripping that oh, like lock, uh, wax. Yep. How come the buy in spots prices aren't going down, therefore lowering the prices of the boxes entirely? How, why is that not happening? People are still forking over the money because they're still taking like these crazy gambles. Yeah. Why don't you just gamble on the sports? I just don't understand that. I never understand that. It's so much less efficient. Uh, I think those people's money's going to zero either way. <laughs> <laughs> but they're off in my pocket. There's, yeah, there's, I don't know. I mean, you can make an argument that buying into a break is more fun than, sure. you know, 
throwing money on a parlay or a money line sure. or something. Sure. Yeah. The break, you get something out of it. Yeah. Even if it's only worth two dollars. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you can win money gambling if you're right, but all right. Yeah, but how often you're probably right less often than you hit a card, like a good card in the break. All right. C rhymes twenty three. He's back. Come back. He's Come back. back. Bull signal to the market. Chase Rhymes is back. I think the bottom is in, Chris. This is like <laughs> like that one sign, and I think this is it. All right. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. He's He wants to know this. Related. Do you think Fanatics is doing a good job? Mm, that was him, huh? Was him. So this is a bi- binary yes or no? I guess so. The the poll result was like seventy five twenty five in favor of no. Yeah, this is like uh, someone made a, a I think it might have been Tyler made a story post about how when uh, Panini first took over, you know, everyone kind of felt the same. Like they were angry, we were losing upper deck and tops. So people are gonna obviously like just kind of be angry at the initial change, basically no matter what they do. Yep. Um, I'd I'd still like to be as positive as we can be at the, about the fanatics and still we don't, they don't have the football or basketball licenses. So it's kind of hard to make an initial judgment, but there's definitely a lot of room for improvement. So. Yeah. Right on. Chase is in the chat. He says, sup guys, I am bidding again. All right. Chase is back. You know, the meme, uh, uh the meme where, uh, the guy's like coming out from behind the tree and he's like, Rubbing his hands together, he's like, "Here we go." That's the case right now. <laughs> I wonder what he's bidding on. That that is something I wonder about. Um, one, you know, Wimbanyama oranges or something. If I had a criticism to offer of the Fanatics tenure so far, well, I have a, I have a few. Uh, the first one is that I don't love the hyper aggression towards the lame duck incumbents. Mm-hmm. I think it. It's, uh, I think hyper aggression towards trying to accelerate the takeover of the basketball and the football licenses has really uh, caused some problems for collectors in terms of slowing the release of products and hiring away all Panini's employees. And uh, it's really put stuff for jeopardy, I think, for the next year or two until those licenses transfer. Now, I'm not saying this out of sympathy towards Panini. Because, you know, Panini, this is a cutthroat licensing world, and Panini <clears throat> took its licenses many years ago <clears throat> with sort of a hand in an iron fist, sort of a, a iron glove or whatever I'm trying to say here. <clears throat> so it's not about sympathy. It's just about it, it's not benefiting us that we have this uh, confusion. This Now we have this massive lawsuit, and it just really seems to be gumming things up on all sides. And preventing a uh, a more amicable transfer of power when the time comes. And uh, another criticism I would have is that things have gotten a little bit gimmicky. I think the uh, the Tom Brady card, which we've discussed this on previous episodes, and it's it's provided a nice promotional platform and so on and so forth. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's a gimmicky item, and gimmicks are fine. I don't love, nobody loves them, but they're fine, but they can't be the defining aspect. Um, they have, the, the gimmicks have to, you know, be the, be on the periphery and there should be real substance at the heart that the gimmicks are drawing people into. So, you know, the, the Brady super is uh, at auction with Golden right now. And I think like with buyer's premium, it's over a hundred thousand dollars. So, yeah, some of the gimmicks I feel like are them sort of feeling like we don't have the football and basketball licenses yet, so we kind of have to like get some attention by making more gimmicks. Yeah, and like the taco fractor, but with baseball, it's at least like what I've seen. It seems like they've made some improvements with within baseball. The one license they do have with like MLB debut, it sounds like they've done a nice job reducing the redemptions. So there are some like tangible things within baseball that we can point to that are like, you know, they didn't screw up the existing system. They made a couple improvements. They added a nice thing. The gimmicks are sort of around it. 
given that they don't have all the licenses yet. So that's kind of like my glass half full response. Yeah, it's a great point. I agree with that. And like to, to what you said as well, they haven't rocked the boat very much. They've stayed true to a lot of the traditions of manufacturing baseball cards. And I'm appreciative of that. And, uh, and, I, and, they, and they employ and continue to employ longtime industry stalwarts who are doing a good job, who have done a good job and are doing a good job. So there's, there's the positive. All right. Uh, let's get to this next question here. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mike Pinkerton 50 says, are sports card influencers shrinking? It seems that there are fewer and fewer. Of them. I mean, they're absolutely shrinking because there's like three of them that have left in the last couple of months from being caught shilling. So it's absolutely, <laughs> absolutely shrinking. Right. Uh, there's like podcasts, a, a, a pretty popular podcast that, that dropped. I don't know if that like we lost influencers with that necessarily, but yeah, it's happening slowly. And that's just like a, a that's just more of a product of like, you know, the price is going down, the excitement level dropping. It's just going to happen naturally. Yeah. And uh, it's nothing to be upset about at all. Right. Purge is good. Yeah, I think it's good. Um, there's not only is the uh, is the tend towards being influencer ish reducing, but it, it's also sort of it's in the air too that people aren't trying to be as influencer -y either. Yeah, I like also it makes for a more enjoyable experience on social media. Although I have new grievances with hobby social media. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I always need... grievances, so let's see yes. yes Festivus edition of the crossover today because I can never be without a grievance I need something tangible to be whining about and <laughs> the, thing I'll, the thing I'll complain about now is that yeah we've lost influencer content to a degree which is good but now so many freaking cards are being posted just so many it's just the the special nature of the unicorn cards even is sort of being stripped away and i just feel like there's nothing is sacred anymore you know yeah. it's all on instagram it's all there now you know you want to see like a a near complete pmg green set go to nab as nubs page there it is um, you want to see 10 Kobe one of ones from his first, from the early part of his career? There they are on Spinatron's page. <clears throat> Amazing. You know, like, look, I'm complaining about the opportunity to see great cards. So uh, take that for what it is. But uh, it's it's getting to be a problem. That's yep. how I feel. I could, I could sense this a few months ago. So I, I've looked like not posted everything i've gotten and i added the feature i added the feature to our collection uh showcase within card ladder where you could like have it in your collection but not have it show up in showcase for this reason because it is there's something to be said for like the mystery that we had five six years ago in some of these cards and i think having some of that mystery even within your own collection could could make it more a little bit more fun so think of maybe think about that as like a a fun side project for if you got something new coming in, you don't have to share it. Yeah, there, there's a that's great. There, there's a new like so we got a question about like uh, new ways that people are flexing on Instagram that we'll get to a little bit. Here's the new 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 flex: don't post your pickups. <laughs> just, but just say you have pickups that you can't post. It's even better. People, <laughs> people get so mad about that. Yeah. I saw a story post from somebody the other day that said, that was that was upset about people cavalierly no that's not the right word casually people casually posting six figure card pickups like haha I just picked up a new card yeah. you know <laughs> it was, it was house, got a new card woohoo yeah yeah just picked up a you know hundred thirty thousand dollar card no biggie having fun fun pickup sold my, <laughs> my uh, uh, Sold my third Airbnb house. Yay. 
<laughs> Created a Lamborghini. Woohoo. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a fun one. This is, I had to do some research to prepare my answer for this question. I like it so much. Uh, this question comes from Art Connoisseur. It is this. What will be the most overused hobby phrase <laughs> in 2024? Okay. Most overused hobby phrase. All right. Well, you did some research. What do you well, got? So, Give me some ideas. So pick I my went favorite. around. Yes. So some people were replying to this. I was asking people what was the what was the most used phrase in 2023, so I could get some ideas. And would you like to hear some of the phrases, some of the most overused phrases of 2023? Yeah, let's go. All right. I'm just... Let's go. A dozen here. Yeah, yeah that's one. 10x the hobby. Yeah, oh my God. That one, God, that one annoys me so much. <laughs> the hobby is dead or the hobby is alive. The hobby is alive. Two variants. Uh, that total sales volume. It's just like a flat line. It's dead. It's a lot. It's like actually, you know, it's pretty stable. <laughs> uh, this feels like it's the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so bad. I can't. Uh. Um, incoming and available. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even have it yet. It's not even their. They're taking a screenshot. From the deal, and it's already available. <laughs> available when in hand. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, considering making this available. Consider. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Well, okay, what's the over under on when it actually is available in terms of days after that phrase comes out of your mouth? It's got to be like two days later. It's like, you know what? It is available. I was just kidding. Oh, what if they sell it fast enough that they can, like, because, you know, there's usually 24 hours. You buy a car and then somebody has to go to the post office to ship it to you. What if they sell it so fast that just, hey, change the address. Just ship it to this guy instead. I always laughed at, uh, like, serious buyers only, as if there's, like, some guy coming in just like, huh, just kidding, man. <laughs> I'm just going to start making some joke offers. Sorry. <laughs> Guy wearing a clown nose. He's just like, well, this offer's a joke, so I'll just say it. This isn't real. Oh, I love this one. Not for sale, not for trade, dot, 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 yet. <laughs> <laughs> He's waiting for the apocalypse. Then he'll sell it. Oh, yeah. Um... Okay, some more uh, that people gave me. Baked in. Baked in. Are these, so these are 2023 yeah, ones? What, what do we say? Why would we change any of this? This just feels like it's... <laughs> yeah, this is going to continue on. Um, yeah. Another one was arbitrage. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Arbitrage is like, that's 2021-ish to me. Yeah. More so. That was like Gary B brought that from the garage sale lexicon. Uh, um liquidity providers. <laughs> I'll just sell it for repackers. <laughs> repackers are keeping this hobby alive. All right. Um next question here from uh oh parabolic says George Parabolic. <laughs> Do the question about uh, I don't I think I thought we got a few on this just sort of like predictions for 2024. We do, no, so we do. There's a bundle. Right, let's, now, go yeah. to that. let's go to that. All right, bundle of questions here on uh, the calendar turning over. Zanu 23 Sports Cards says, "What are your 2024 hobby goals?" Drake's PC says, "Reflecting on 2023, what do you wish you did more of and less of in the hobby, and what are your resolutions for 2024?" And Ryan Bitter says, what are your hobby directions for 2024 and reflections on 2023? Hmm. What I w always wish I'd do less of is just like buying things that distract me from kind of like my main focuses and having to like pivot out of it and just wasting time. So focusing more in 2024 and 
more specific things. Um, do you have anything? On, do you have anything to add? Love on that one? one. Me too. That's like that's one I've been definitely focusing on for the last three to four months. Especially considering anything we bought early 2023 probably went down in value when we changed our minds and sold it later to move into something else. Right. Yeah, that's a great one. That's that's definitely at the top of my list. Is just yeah. really focusing, staying disciplined, um, not having the ticky tack pickups. Yeah, I think us as buyers in twenty twenty four. If you have, if you do have cash, if you're a buyer and you're looking to buy stuff, I think you have a lot. I think we have a lot more leverage as buyers right now. Mm-hmm. So just like being patient with it and kind of taking advantage of that as much as you can and using that to like find stuff for sale you might not have in the previous years and stretching your dollar a little bit more yeah yeah uh all right i do have a take, take though on just sort of like the generic prediction for 2024 because i know that that question coming up like what do you guys think is this the bottom you know what's the market going to do 2024 I was listening to um, a similar podcast about this topic for uh, um, the Derek Thompson one what's that show called oh yeah uh, uh, the one in the ringer in English yeah, yeah so he right. he got into this and he was talking about how we've had just insane volatility where it was like COVID super down post COVID super up you know, the last year, way down. He thinks that 2024 is going to be like the boring year that we haven't had in a while. And it's just like the sort of flat, like slow, either slow growth or kind of slow continuing decline. And he's saying that's like a, a good thing, you know, like let's get some stability. Let's have some like, let's go back to like 2% growth on some of these, you know, Jordan PSA 10 graphs. Let's go back to like having a stable year because it's been a while. So I'm on that train. Let's have a boring. 2024. Nice. All right, I'm going to go against that. I think that 2024 is going to be characterized by the invasion of politic talking oh. into the Yep. I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying this more as like a precaution or a fear, but I also think there's a decent chance of it happening of just like, you're going to come on Instagram hobby Instagram in like October yeah. or September Sorry. and you're going to yeah. see a lot of fucking story posts that have nothing to do with cards or sports that are given, you know, <laughs> very like uh, uh, high highfalutin takes on politics and yeah. the presidential election and so on and so forth. Because there is something irresistibly addicting to the human being about having an audience through a social media account. Yeah, and they're going to be trying to angle those predictions into like how it's going to affect the economy. Like, oh, if guys, you know, if we vote this way, you know, if, if that's the change <laughs> that you see, you have to sift from blue from blue to red. Just wait for the explosion, you guys. This is going to be you know how those conservatives are. It's like way more about uh, the economy and the, you know. <laughs> so uh, there's going to be a lot of that too. Right. Yeah. That's funny. That's going to be the tactic to uh, to persuade the card audience. People can do it either way. I've seen people that are like, you know, blue is what caused the crash. And then, you know, the market recovered and went up. Well, that's because, you know, the blue side is like more, you know, like it's better for jobs it's like all the you could just say whatever you want whatever sways the direction you want it to go it's fine we're just going to hear all the different directions it takes yes sir all right sorry to be the downer on that one but uh somebody had to say it you're just the downer tonight yes yeah when i was going through these questions and seeing how people are feeling it was just making me laugh so much (laughs) and i was and i just started getting into the mindset of negativity and complaining and yeah now i'm just i'm in that zone i think most people go into the new year's positive you know 
people are going to the gyms and stuff like right. that. They're they're hitting up all these uh, positivity swings and they're getting all excited about you know that kind of stuff. So you're you're just zagging. I'm zagging. I'm zagging against the new year. Q1 is probably the worst quarter. That's what you're saying. <laughs> Q1 is the yeah, we make annual goals. This is the worst time. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is from AA Collectibles 91 on Kesh. He had the question, have either of you had a material change in opinion, positively or negatively, on a single player over the course of this season? And if mm. so, who? And I think he's referring to the NFL season, right? Because that season's just about over. Yes, I was thinking about that um i came up with one where i've shifted and i'm like out on them and i'm negative on them but i couldn't figure i couldn't think of it one where i'm shifted to be positive about which is maybe i'm you now nice good because i only had a positive answer to this oh perfect yeah we're, we'll switch roles for the rest of the show we will be my <laughs> so mine was trevor lawrence i was really excited about trevor lawrence last year he had that sweet playoff game i thought he was kind of like coming into his own coming in this year and he's really disappointed he's like bottom half per he's basically like an average quarterback at best and the jags are like barely over 500 he's had some real dud games i don't know he i just thought um like i said coming off that charger game he was just going to come on the scene strong he did not he's been very disappointing yes uh that is something that i would agree with Although I was never super high on him, but yeah, I mean, he is not ascending to like a top five QB. Right. right. Now. Fantasy in our league, he went for like 40 bucks. Do you remember that? I, I put him up knowing he was going to go high. He went for like 40 bucks and he was basically like bottom third fantasy quarterback. That's funny. I remember us funneling all the quarterbacks we, to go. We already had ours. We already had ours. Okay. Uh, here is my player. Granted, I watch a lot of 49ers, okay, so <laughs> obviously I know more about this guy than most people do, but Brandon Ayuk, Brandon Ayuk yes. is the player. Let's, Let's go. Yeah. He, on um, ESPN Analytics receiver rankings, he scored a perfect 99 wow. this year, and that obviously was first in their um, – tracking analytics so they track three categories how open you are how skilled you are at catching and yards after catch and he scores perfect in catch and then overall when you stack up all the receivers and tight ends he scored a perfect 99 and then on the season he led the league in yards per reception he led the league in yards per target he led the leagues in yards per route run he had over 1,300 receiving yards and 72 receptions. And he would have had way more, but he oftentimes wasn't doing anything in the second half because the team was just running the ball. They were up a lot. So that is my Brandon Ayuk, and he's 25 years old. He had a very, very – and he got snubbed from the Pro Bowl, which is also why I like throwing him up a bone. This is not good for your Brock Purdy takes. you got <laughs> best receiver – the best running back, the best left tackle. This is not good for you. He, Brandon Ayuk, um, and so I, look, I went back and I looked like previous seasons. So in 2022, he was seventh on ESPN's analytics. In 2021, he <clears throat> was even lower. Um, in 2021, he was 27th. In 2020, 20, he was 37th, so like he was like 37, 27, 7, and then 1. And that, yeah. that does coincide with a certain quarterback arrived. How old is he? 25? 20, 25. Yeah. Yeah, he's good. He, has, he doesn't really get much at all talked about in any circle. TV, media, yeah, NBC, nothing. The season he had was phenomenal. Yeah. This guy is always wide open 20 yards down the field. Yeah. He is really, really good. Yeah. He was awesome. He was great. He was fun to watch. Yeah. All right. Some in personal. Next question here uh, from Chad Penny Sleeve. What's up, Charlie? 
who is the most collectible player on the Clippers? Mm. And I put this to a poll. So I, I said, James Harden, Kawhi, Paul George, Russell Westbrook. Did you see, yeah. see the results? I think it was like Kawhi and Westbrook and like nothing for George and yeah. Harden. Kawhi. I was like over 50%. Westbrook was at about 25 to 30%. And then it was like 10% each for yeah. Harden and Pete. Yeah, and the Kawhi thing is probably just like the two finals MVPs. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. And plus, you know, people like him, I think. People just like his uniqueness and like the style that he plays. And... He's low drama too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And like, I think it also is a factor that, that he's playing very, very well right now. He hasn't yeah. lost a game since November 30th, so I think there's some reasons he buys there. Yeah. Yeah, I said... What, did you, what do you think, though? Who do you say? I said Westbrook. I've always thought he was, like, a collectible, exciting player. People just have been down on him lately, you know, just, like, the whole Lakers thing did not working out. And But prior to that, he was, like, one of the more exciting players in the NBA. He, like, averaged triple doubles. Four years in a row, he has an MVP. He was part of those young Thunder teams, like, and he was always seen as like, a, you know, like a very, very active, you know, hundred percent go all out type guy, which I thought was the collectible aspect of him. For sure. Yeah, um, I don't have really strong nostalgia for any of those players, which is almost like a categorical decline for me to collect any of them. There needs to be something. I need to have some sort of connection to the player on some level. And I think because of that, then, if I were to pick one of those players to collect, I would lean into the best player who's on the Clippers right now. And and that's Kawhi. So I think I would lean Kawhi on that because then I would be rooting for him and rooting for the Clippers to do well. But then I don't think I would ever start down that path because I'd just be so concerned that as it has for the last three or four years, the playoffs are going to end short in an injury. (laughs) So, But you have a lot to hang your hat on as a Kawhi collector. you got two finals MVPs. Oh, this is is a question. Would you rather, if you were Kawhi, would you, for your legacy, would you rather have two finals MVPs or one finals MVP and one regular season MVP? Mm. I would probably, if I were Kawhi, and I could pick which of the two, can I pick which one of the finals MVPs I lose? Sure. I would, yeah, you could lose the Spurs one, right? I would lose the Spurs one and give it yep. to Duncan or whoever, and then add myself a regular season MVP after those guys retired before he goes to the Raptors. Or, even better, put the MVP season on that Raptors season and just make a all in one year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. Um, Kawhi had a season that was, was MV, that was regular season MVP caliber. Yeah, he did. It was, it was like 2015, right? Yeah. 2016? I'm looking to find it, right? It was that's the first. Yeah, so the 2016-17 season, yeah. I have him as having the highest composite score of any player in the league if you average their ranks and PER, BPM, and win shares for 48. So he, he had a very strong MVP argument in 2016-17, and he didn't win it. I agree with you. I, I, would, I would rather have the one finals MVP and the one regular season MVP as opposed to the two. Because the finals MVP was more of like him being the X factor for that Spurs team to get him over the hump because he was like guarding LeBron. He was like the up and coming guy. He was young versus like MVP is like you're the best player in in the world. You know, that's a big, big difference. Yeah, exactly right. Now, if I were Aaron Rodgers and I had four right regular season MVPs and one Super Bowl MVP, I would trade one of my regular season MVPs to get a, another Super Bowl MVP. So if I were Aaron Rodgers, I would like to go from three to two rather yes. than four and one. I would do the same if 
if I was LeBron. Oh, really? Go to five titles in three regular season MVPs? Because, Interesting. Because he's got he already has this thing where people they did this with Jordan too, rightfully so, where it's like, oh, he's the best player, but they're just not going to give him the MVP because they're bored of it. So he already has that sort of like baked into his career. And if you took one away, they they would just be like, well, he's got seven anyways. Who cares? He's only got three. Right. That's a good point. All right. Um, <clears throat> from enjoy cards underscore IG. I feel there are some flippers that are really careful and slick in presenting themselves as collectors, hyping certain players as their PC players, pretty much so they can flip them. Please talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Yeah, those uh, PC players seem to change pretty frequently, don't they? Especially with the uh, with the season. Like, oh, my PC guy right now is Desmond Ritter, but uh, come basketball season, it's going to be Zion. You see, right? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's that's very annoying because it's not honest. You know? Yeah, that's that's the thing that it always comes back to. Is that like people when people are like speaking you know, from their personal bully pulpit, which is their Instagram story or their Instagram posts, and they're saying things that are intended to, like, encourage us to buy into a hype that they don't actually believe in themselves. It pisses people off. Yeah, especially when you we know what cards they own, and then when we see them at auction, oh, it's like, yeah, <laughs> uh, there's another question that I thought would, would be a good follow on to this. Uh, it was from Drake, I want to say. Okay, yeah, here we go. This comes from Drake. Drake's PC. Drake says, uh, discuss being careful where you get your information. We go to collectors who have cards we desire because we view them as experts. But how can we disseminate between education for its own sake and education for the purpose of increasing the demand or value around a player or a set or a parallel? Yeah. Man, I think, I think you just you you have to end up getting the information and knowledge you gain from the space on yes. your own over a long time, no matter what. Like, there's just not gonna, there's never gonna be one singular person that you could go to. I mean, obviously, you can sort of like build up a community of people you trust, and you can get pieces, you know, bits and pieces from here and there, and like, you know, pick up trends and stuff from people you talk to that you that you enjoy talking with. And you know, you may pick up stuff like you and I chat. You know, I pick up stuff from you here and there. But overall, like, I still have to make all my own choices, and I have to, I have to take my own lumps. And that's you know, years of experience. We've talked about this a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I believe it was. Gandhi, who said, trust but verify. Trust but verify. I like that. Yeah, it was some, it was some influential figure. Trust but verify. <laughs> yeah, dude, we, um, we even do that with card letter, right? Like, we don't just, uh, you know, give you this magic number with, no, with you know, like, here's the number, here's how we came up with it. You can use it if you'd like. You can look, look at how we came up with it and disagree and find your own number. That's but, you know, that's what the point of some of this sales data is and comping and stuff, figuring out yourself. Yes, ex exactly. That, okay, so here's a thought I have about this question. A few people have corrected me. That was Reagan, not Gandhi. Uh, ah, oh, nice. same thing. Oh, that was close. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the thing I think about here is that there is so much information in the hobby surrounding sets and checklists and how many total cards that a player has. There's a Dirk Nowitzki collector who recently posted to Instagram an update of how his super collecting is coming coming along. And he had completed some percentage, some very impressive percentage of the total Dirk body of cards that are available. And the total number was like somewhere around 7,000 to 8,000. Uh, 7,000 to 8,000 cards. Is that unique card? Yeah, unique cards. Like, parallels included? Yeah. Okay, that's what I meant, yeah. Yeah, definitely parallels included. 
And then he had it broken down by like autograph cards, patch autograph cards, patch cards, parallels, and what percentage of completion he had. And I bring that up. I bring up that number just as a number to wrap our heads around. There are over 7,000 Dirk Nowitzki unique cards. And there's no person, there's no conversation, there's no one interaction. There's no, no, uh, there's no, there's no concise way to internalize and process all that information. It just requires research, it requires a knowledge of everything that's available and a consistent method for ranking it that you can apply from one player to the next. So like, you know, having an understanding of what are the top brands, why they're the top brands, what sells the strongest, why it sells the strongest, and then being able to apply that to the body of work of a, of a player, you know, to, to your point, you have to know that on your own. Or else you're just gonna like get a you're just gonna get a little sliver you're just gonna get a little peek at the full picture you know the most of the picture is gonna be blurry and just a little bit of it's gonna be in focus you might not even know how much more picture there is that you're missing if you know you 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 get sucked into a, an Instagram post that's like telling you how great one card is it's like yeah okay this card looks great it's rare so on and so forth but compared to what you know what are the what are the next best alternatives, and those are the questions that you need to know to ask. And the only way you can know to ask them is by knowing about the breadth of the cards that are available for different players and all the different sets that are available. And it seems like a lot, and it is a lot, but also once you wrap your mind around it, you sort of understand the structure of releases from year to year and how in a given like 2022, 23 basketball i was just looking at the checklist of all the basketball releases from that season it's about like 30 it's like 25 or 30 different products it's not too much you know but you just you need a framework for how to think about that stuff and how to categorize different products and so it's it's never even if a person is trying their very best to give you some objective information about a card it's still not enough you have to complement it with an understanding of everything else that's out there yeah, plus i don't really want anyone else to take Taking the joy of discovering it on my own away from me. If you just give me the answer and give me the top five, just buy these five cards and this is the best way to collect this player. Like there's no enjoyment part. One of the most fun parts of collecting is like discovering that and coming to those conclusions on your own. Exactly. Okay. Mohammed asked for the name of this account. The name of the account is uh, Dirk Super Collector. Should have known. <laughs> And then here's the post I was referencing. So total available, wow. 7,457. And he has over 5,400 of them. Wow. Yeah. So, well, he, has the, he has the proper Instagram handle, doesn't he? Yeah. yeah, he is not misleading anybody with that handle. All right. Uh. This is from the Konomi card. The Konomi card says, please discuss the importance of relationships in this space. Mm. Um, the importance, I don't know that like it's super important in order to build your collection. I think that might be a little bit overrated. You know, I, I think you could build a pretty sweet collection just as a hermit just buying stuff on ebay just finding stuff waiting for it to hit auction you know there is like a sense of, of hey i need to ha have the right connections to be able to pry out some of these one-on-ones and stuff and that may be true but i think if you have enough patience and longevity in the space like it, a, a lot of it will show up on an auction and you don't even need help it's really more, more of just like an additive thing to make the experience more fun like being around because that's what we as humans are looking for we're looking for a community you know, we're looking for like, like uh, relationships with people that have similar tastes as us. That's like the whole subreddit world. And I think this, it's a very additive thing. Going to the shows, you know, chatting with people who are as, as weird as you are, frankly, like to collect, you know, small pieces of cardboard with pictures of athletes on it. It's a strange thing, but to have someone that can relate to it 
is just kind of like a thing that makes it more fun. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, the power relationships, the best part about it is it makes collecting a lot more fun. I'm going to go against sort of the premise of the question as well. Um, and, 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 and I agree with you, though. Like, <laughs> I agree with you that, like, there are – it's very additive. I love the subreddit insight there. But I'm going to go against this, too, and just say that um, I think this, this approach backfires sometimes. And people think relationships are so important that they get pressured into doing and saying and thinking things that they don't agree yeah. with that they don't believe in. And then yeah. it creates, like, there's an excess of a herd mentality and a copycat mentality in the hobby because there's some level of thinking of, like, I don't want to upset anybody. I don't want to step on any toes. I don't want to mess up the flow here. I don't, I don't want to interrupt the pump. I don't want to interrupt the 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 hype train that cards that I own might be on, so on and so forth. And uh, but but yeah, but the the flip side of the coin is that obviously relationships can enhance the hobby, and you should always be treating people with dignity and respect, and giving people the benefit of the doubt until they show you otherwise. Which like we also could use a bit more of that too. Uh, but yeah, that's that's how I kind of go against it, though. Sim similar to you, <laughs> is that uh, there's a little too much pressure sometimes to just go along and to not speak out against something if it's off. So <laughs> interrupt the pump. All right. Next question here from Big J Basketball. The new flex seems to be showing off cards with little to no sales history in card ladder. <laughs> True or false? Especially when the sales that you show don't have images. Like they're such old sales that we don't even have the images because they're, you know, the, the archive is too old to grab them. Those are that's <laughs> the flex. It's just so, like you're like looking at it. What card is? Oh, it's like green PMG. Whatever the hell. Who is this? Exactly. So, <clears throat> MK, damn, where did his post go? Did he delete it? No, he wouldn't delete it. It, might, it must have just expired. MK had a post that had the search blocked out, but it had no results. And he said, I've, you know, I just picked up a card that has no public comps at all. <clears throat> and, uh, yes, this is the new flex. And this, this is the direction things are going to go in now, I think. And it's an interesting, it's an interesting way to sort of like give an extra emphasis to a card that isn't a one of one, but is almost better because it's never sold. There's one of ones that have sold four times. You know, this, this card is never sold. And the implication being, if this card is never sold, it's highly collectible. Nobody wants wants to let this card go. And yeah, especially if, it, especially if it made it through these last four years with no comps. It's like, how did you dodge all of that? How did you dodge all those uh, chances <laughs> to sell it? Yeah. And I think that's generally true. I think that's a generally true thing. But sometimes a card, this particularly applies to more so older cards, but Sometimes a card doesn't have a sales history because nobody gives a shit about the card. <laughs> yeah, I I personally like the ones that have sold like two or three times. That's like the sweet spot for me. Like I want to know that it's real and it's sold at some point, especially when it's like a 2013 sale and like a 2017 sale and that's it. Those are those are kind of what I like to see personally. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So we'll we'll take a sale from 2013, maybe one or two in the 2016 or 2020 window, and that's good. Nothing pandemic. No pandemic sale. No pandemic sale, so that people can go look at how much value the card has lost. If you, from the have you ever have you ever gone to card ladder the ladder page and sorted by number of sales like the stuff at the top? Yeah. Dude, that shit sells. Some of those cards 
sell more frequently than like the next hundred combined. Like some of these cards sell, like the grippy yeah. traded one, the card sells like every five minutes. Yes, that card has a ton of sales. And, and there's something to be said about that. Like uh, when, when, if a card comes to market quite a bit, one, one conclusion you can draw from that is that there's a decent number of sellers who think the card's market value is worth more than the card is worth to them. And if that, yeah. that's true, then you, then, you know, in other words, there's a, you could, you could read that as being, this is a desired card. This is a card that there are some people out there who want this card more than the person who currently has in their possession. And so there's a demand for this card. And when you have, there, there are instances when a card doesn't have a sales history. And the reason why is because the, the value of the card, the demand for the card is so low that it that people rather just keep the card than go through the effort to sell it and take its its market value. Yep. All right. Uh, let's go on to the next question here. From LSU Tiger Collector 65. Why why are so many influencers video thumbnails showing them making the mouth open surprised face? <laughs> That's like a Mr. Beast thing. You know, like a pot, that's like a gen general YouTube thing that Mr. Beast and some of those like famous YouTubers popularize and they're just dealing from that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my brother has uh, given me the idea that like there might be a correlation causation problem here mm. where there's a belief that taking that picture is going to get more clicks, it's going to get more people to go in and see the video. And the belief that belief exists because people like Mr. Beast who have tens of millions of views, they make that type of thumbnail. So since the person who has 10 million views on a video right. has this thumbnail, it must be the thumbnail that's driving people to click. Right. But it might just be a coincidence. It might just be Mr. Beast likes the way this looks or he finds it funny or, you know, and the, but then it got converted into this marketing gospel that if you want to increase your YouTube click rate, you know, gape like a fool yep. on the thumbnail. I really hope that, like, it was more deliberate than that, and the guy was like, I wonder how many idiots I can make copy me do this. <laughs> and Christina gives the conspiracy. There's, a, <laughs> there's, like, a trend in YouTube where it's the it's that thumbnail, it's, like, the, the quick edits, you know, like, the quick cuts where you could like see they cut out all the pauses right they just they really shorten the video up but there's like a, a few new youtubers um there's like this one guy in this in the fitness world who he's like doing the complete opposite his thumbnails are just like pictures of him and, like clips from the video he just randomly picks one the videos are super long he doesn't edit anything it's like him talking in his car super long form and he's he's like blowing up he's got millions of subscribers so now there's like this sort of pendulum swing where people now are thinking well, what if i just do the complete opposite and that actually might get me more subscribers so to your point it was a bit of like everyone's doing this because it's working but now people are maybe doing the opposite because that might work and get more attention you'll stand out more so i think maybe just like yeah sam sulik is the guy I'm thinking of. yeah everything is just a reaction to the thing that came before it. <laughs> yeah. all right uh this one from Vinny Slab Arena. Nice softball from Vinny. Vinny says, I always enjoy the show. I feel like I should know this as a long time mm. listener. But why is your show called The Crossover? Happy New Year, Vinny. Well, it's because of a it's because of a style phase that I was going through when we like my dressing style when we first started the show. I I was trying some things out. Oh my god. And but now I'm back. I'm back. Yikes! <laughs> I was going from three XL hoodies to two X, and I went back to two X. Now I think the crossover name, which came from uh, Twenty Three Over Elo, uh, great Michael Jordan Marshall Fall collector, was because of a crossover appeal uh, from you being a LeBron collector and Christina and myself being Michael Jordan collectors. But actually, I think it was. That that's part of it. I think it was also originally that I had my show and you guys had your show, and we were crossing over the two platforms yes. into one show. Yes, 
Yes, exactly. That was a factor as well. That was so long ago that we both haven't had our own show <laughs> in like three years. Or you guys aren't crossing over shows anymore. This is just the show. This is it's just the show now. Almost uh, four years. Damn near four years of the crossover. It's almost happening <laughs> now when someone remembers the old two shows. Right. Right. All right. Um, what, what should we go to next? Okay. From Ash Artois, uh, do you have do any of you have non-sport cards? And first, has this been asked before? First off, I just want to say what's up, Ash. She's my girl. Okay. And then um, I do have a couple Star Wars cards and a Lord of the Rings ring. That's right. You have a Yoda. I do. A Yoda out of 10. A Yoda out of 10. 22 Galaxy and a Leia out of 150 that I pulled myself and then graded. Yes. So those Star Wars packs right. are fun, right? Those were Tops Chrome. Yes. Yeah, Chrome Galaxy. Those are fun, right? Yeah, I, I had fun ripping that box. Yeah. It's like shiny cards of like a fun franchise that you have nostalgia for. It's, it's a, I mean, that's an easy exactly. win. And the same thing with the Lord of the Ring card. Uh, I ripped that as well, and then graded it, and it was it, it was the nostalgia thing that made me go and buy the box. And then we pulled a Moff Gideon card, who is portrayed in The Mandalorian by Giancarlo Esposito. Nice. Remember that? This was years ago, but I graded it. From what, though? Uh, like, what did we open that we got that? It was some Star Wars box. Interesting. But um, I'm going to have to go pessimistic on this question. So, so do you remember we had Josh Luber on years ago? <laughs> it was probably about three years ago. And this is, what, this is my concern about the non-sport genre getting taken too far. So at first, it starts with an interest in Jimi Hendrix cards or, you know, classic Beatles cards, Superman, Batman. Um, but then, you know, we start getting more creative with the boundaries and, you know, soon we have jackass cards, which people liked. People like the jackass cards as a product, but that's a pretty fringe franchise. And there's probably a lot of different franchises that would get cards before Jackass um, if all licensing opportunities were possible. So then I start to get a little bit concerned because I just say, what's the long-term collectability of a Jackass product? It just, it seems to be, um, that product seems to be very, very much a, a short-lived thing. Those boxes still Oh, right. They do. They're a stable price. They don't fluctuate. And they're very affordable, right? Like a hundred bucks a box. Approximately. Yeah. Okay, but even then, like I think we're still fine. Like I think we're still okay. Plus, they have a cult following. That they do. It's a horrible IP to have a card set for. Here's where I get concerned. Yeah. I get concerned when when Lou, and this is why I bring up Luber, when Luber was on the show, he eventually said he wants to do sets based on different cities. And so there would be a set about the city of Phoenix. <laughs> and then he said that there would be an insert set or some part of the set dedicated to the best of things, you know, the best this, the best that in the city of Phoenix. And then he said there would be the best dentists <laughs> of Phoenix in the product. Okay. And if, if, if the slippery slope of non-sport cards ends up that we have inserts that celebrating dentists in cities, I'm against it. And I, and I, it, it's like, would you kill baby Hitler? I have to go back, back and put an end oh my God. To, <laughs> to the slippery slope of the non-sport cards. 
That's my pitch. New rule for 2024. <laughs> <laughs> you kill the, the uh, Topps Chrome Disney and Star Wars products just so you don't have to have the best uh, uh, building in Phoenix set? Yes. Smart. It's worth it. <clears throat> it is worth it. No, I mean, <laughs> people got very excited about this. <laughs> people got very excited about the Disney cards, right? And yeah. And, problem, and, yeah. and people love Lorcana and people love, love mm -hmm. um, people love Pokemon. Yes. That's you know, CG, though. That's different than non -sports. in fact, the gem rate report on grading metrics suggests that Pokemon was a huge growth category for the grading companies in 2023. And, yeah. and uh, sports took a bit of a step back. We'll see. Yeah. I had this conversation actually today with Tom Pancake Analytics about what you should call IP like Star Wars and Marvel. Mm. And I think it should be called entertainment because defining something as what it's not is kind of disrespectful. Yep, I've heard that before. We have brought that up on the show years ago. Yeah. That uh, collectors of entertainment cards yeah. did not like referring to them as not a sport. True. But I would say that, that Pokemon is TCG and that's different than entertainment slash non sport and sports, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. All right. There you go. All right. I tried to get some content out of the non sport question because I don't own any non sport cards. I don't have a desire to. And I think there's also a little bit of a risk of conflating the market for sports cards with the market for non-sports cards, the market for sports cards has an engine that is the non-stop news cycle surrounding sports outcomes. And that news cycle doesn't only impact active players. The shadow cast by retired players is constantly being measured against the performance of the active players. Legacies, the understanding of legacies, players' rankings, it's constantly evolving and changing. And that gives a dynamism to the sports card market that allows things to fluctuate naturally, organically, in response to news cycles. Now, people can reply to that and say, yeah, well, music has billboard charts, movies have charts, movies have Rotten Tomatoes scores, you know, celebrities circulate throughout culture, um, so on, but, but it's not the same. It's, it, there is not this energy, this constant news cycle surrounding the advancing and the regressing of players and legacies it's just that language that mode of thought does not exist outside of the world of sports and so i think that's where i want to give a serious level of caution is if there's a thinking that as it once was popularized a few years ago well charizard can't tear an acl so charizard must be a better thing to buy than your favorite sports athlete than Babe Ruth. That's true. Charizard can't tear an ACL. Charizard also can't win a championship. Charizard can't add to the Charizard resume or the GOAT debate. So there's sides, there's levels to this. And that's where I get worried is when we slip from, hey, entertainment cards are great to why aren't they just as good as sports cards. Why aren't they better than sports cards? Well, there's one of the reasons why. Yeah, I was had an issue with uh, people that uh, speak to a sports card audience, trying to get them to buy into the hype of a non-sports card thing, just so that they could profit from it. Like they would say, "Oh, Bill Gates is the goat of like." They're using terms that we know from sports cards. Like they'll say, "Oh, he's the goat of business." So you you should buy this uh, fucking uh, ID card from his first year at Microsoft. This is going to be the next asset class. This is like the big non-sports thing you need to jump on. You all you sports guys don't know what you're missing. You know that kind of talk. I always got annoyed with like trying to pull from the sports, you know, like by using some of the terms to like move them over to non-sports. Yeah. That's a that's an even better way to put it. With a good example, and then and it even happens with then sports you know like hey cricket most popular one of the most popular sports in the world so shouldn't the goat of cricket shouldn't his best card be worth as much as babe ruth's best yeah. card 
Yeah, but they don't have the history and licensed products to be able to stand on. That's like one thing that people never give sports cards credit for, and it drives me nuts. It's like most of the value is is built into the fact that there's like a history and a provenance of these like sets and these companies that make the cards. That's like a huge part of it. People don't actually care about people don't care about the fucking one by one jersey cut out of it. They care about the fact that that jersey is in a National Treasures product. That's the true rookie patch auto of their player. It's a big difference. Exactly. And like something that I said on an earlier question that I've been thinking about a little bit lately is I think about like what players I PC. If I don't have a nostalgic connection to something, I'm not going to, um, there, there's a good chance anyway i'm not going to have the emotional drive the passion to collect that the cards or the products of that player and i think that, that transfers over like very few people are as passionate about the stock price or the growth of a business as compared to the people who are passionate about their favorite sports team your sports team and the players that you like and that you root for, that is an acceptable social medium for painting your face. <laughs> an episode of Seinfeld that I recently saw oh where Elaine's date is, he paints his face to go to the New Jersey Devils game and she's just like, wow, this is, I'm breaking up with you over this. It's so extreme. But sports is the, is the acceptable medium for hot takes, for anger, for yelling, for raging, for crying, for celebrating, for everything. That, that sports in particular are a dedicated channel where it's socially acceptable to do that. We aren't doing that because the, the water utility company <laughs> has increased its profits by, you know, 2%. Q1 over Q2. We're I'm like, painting my face in the colors of the water utility company. We're standing outside their building like, let's go. You guys are killing them. <laughs> so, like, sports is a channel to express those emotions and those passions. And that is highly correlated to why the sports card market as a collectibles market uh, has is, is an engine, it's a driving force behind it. Yeah. And you're not just going to be able to translate that over. <clears throat> so, like, and I think about that back to my own collecting, about, like, I want to collect either players that I can actively root for and be a part of and build nostalgia with or players that I already have it for. And, uh, uh, and that speaks to sort of the history of collecting that you were referring to right. and how that really matters. <laughs> it matters a ton. All right. Uh, uh, next question here for basketball card collector 93, sort of a little bit on a similar topic. This, this is when, you know, when you start getting questions and topics like this is sort of when, you know, there's like an, an optimism return yeah. when people, are, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? When Chase Ryan so, just Chase, shows his presence. Chase is back. All right. <laughs> uh, this question is, uh, as a card collector, are there any game worn memorabilia pieces you would actually consider trading or moving cards in order to acquire? I am a card collector first, but there are instances where I think I would move non grail cards for a unique game worn or signed item. For example, I recently bought a rookie game used Sean Livingston jersey. He's a big Sean Livingston collector. And it required me to move a few cards that I had duplicates of. Mm. I mean, this is a, like a hard no for both of us. But what did what made you think that this is the return of the bottom? Return of the bottom. Well, it's just from the bottom. When I think when uh, when times are pessimistic, we retreat into tried and true things that we know and that we're most comfortable with and we don't want to explore we don't want to take risks we don't want to go out into new stuff and try new things we don't see optimism we don't see growth in the immediate future instead we tend towards a conservatism and a pessimism but when people are asking about you know new categories expanding horizons going into new things to me that telegraphs some level of optimism that mm. there's going to be 
be growth in this area or this area is emerging or there's something positive here that's going on. Yeah, I guess. So that's why, that's why I relate this back. Yeah, yeah I mean, this for me as well, um, there, I definitely would not, I mean, Christine and I have some cool, you have some cool uh, mem items, like an autograph poster, autograph picture. Yeah. Something like that. It makes for a nice gift. I have an autograph loop of wall right behind you. Yeah, an autograph ball. Yeah, I, those are, I have an autograph jersey. I just feel like those are, like you said, they're more like gifts. Like they're more just like items in my possession. I'm not like actively seeking to build a collection around it. Where, you know, like with cards, you have this like sense of, of checklist and you have, you're moving through the year years you want to get the 2004 upper deck 2005 there's that sort of thing but with memorabilia it's it's like i just need one maybe at, at most you know it's like i just don't see i don't see the aesthetic difference between you know a, a random year versus another year of a memorabilia they're all they all kind of look the same yes exactly a novelty item and they're, they do they yes. make they make for good uh gifts they can be displayed I have them on my wall, yeah, for sure. And yeah, yeah I have my maxi shoes display that I got from Matt, right? Exactly. Uh, the more, but the more like furniture, yes. And then the concern here the ever the ever present concern with every emerging category that seeks to capture card collectors is that that's uh, you know, number one to the points we were just making, all the history of card collecting, all the passion behind it, the tradition of it, the fact that you did it when you were a kid, you have to throw all that away. That's not going to go with you when you go into a new category or a new thing. You're starting over from scratch. You have to build that nostalgia, that passion. You have to build all that from scratch. Maybe you can, I can't, nor do I want to. But the, the other thing is that there is a real market dilution risk every time if every card collector decided to go from being 100 percent cards to 50 percent cards 20 percent nfts 20 percent memorabilia and 10 percent type one photos slash ticket stubs if everybody did that it would cut the demand for cards in half and i don't know if people make that connection yeah people seem to think that the growth of the other categories is going to help everything well i'm not sure how that math works either it's like oh man if we start getting all excited about every category and everyone grows up all tides you know tides raise all boats kind of thing i don't know if that's true because it seems like it's a zero-sum game with just the fact that there's not infinite money yeah it is a zero-sum game unless there's enough incoming new collectors right to offset the diffusion of money to multiple different categories. And the new categories will experience a temporary raise in the demand, but if the passion isn't there, and if people aren't loving that new category and they lose interest in it, or they retreat back to what they know in, for example, being cards, then you're gonna get the bubble effect. You're gonna get the middle finger graphs in the new area. So you know, this is a battle that I'm always fighting on multiple fronts is the battle of loyalty to cards. And I am loyal to cards and to the card industry to a fault. Just my position, nothing wrong with anybody who doesn't feel that way. But in fairness, the criticism that I offer um, is, is a serious concern that hey, what, what happens if we, you know, if every card collector was convinced to allocate half of their collecting resources to things other than cards? Well, the demand for cards is going to plummet. That's what happens. <clears throat> but, but, all right, not really worried about that happening. Except for type one photos, you're, you're nervous. <laughs> yeah, that, that I, don't, I don't know if we can withstand. I think ticket stubs are dead, right? I haven't heard jack shit about ticket stubs in a while. Well, that's the concern too, right? It's like there's an energy and excitement 
derived from the newness of yes. it. That's what like happens the, when it's not new anymore? It's the FOMO of like, I'm learning about this thing before the general public gets in on it and I'm going to profit from it. That's usually where it starts. And then there's like some very, very, very small percentage of people who actually enjoy it. Then there's a, you know, a smaller percentage who stick with it. Like you said, that actually derive that uh, build up some organic passion from it and stay with it long term. Whereas with cards, I mean, that's already like a, a built in thing. There's hundreds of years of like people doing it. So it's just a much easier. And the nostalgia, the, 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 um, like the, uh, the reboot of it with like, like having kids and stuff like it's just a very easy thing to point to. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, let's see here. We have about, okay. We've got some time left there. Where should we go to next here? All right. <clears throat> this one from Dorman stash. We can give a little practical thoughts to this question. He says, I want to consolidate my collection. I have a lot of slabs I've collected over the past several years that I would like for somebody else to own. I've sold a dozen or so cards on eBay myself. Most of these cards are not very high value. I'm thinking about selling myself, but I'm not sure if I should use someone like Probstein or MC to potentially get more exposure, maximize my return. Furthermore, if I decide to use a third party, will the government still be coming at me with a tax bill? Thank you and happy new year. <laughs> well, even if the government doesn't directly send you paperwork, you're still obligated to report yourself, your own gains. It's like when you go to the casino and then you're doing your tax at the end of the year, you're supposed to say like what profits you made from the casino. There's not like a form necessarily that you get depending on what sort of thresholds you hit, but just making that clear for anyone trying to dodge paying their taxes, you're still supposed to report even if there's not an official form been given to you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've never signed with a big consigner like uh, through on eBay. I know you have. So what do you, what do you say about selling yourself versus consign? I personally like using consigners. Um, I've recently used MC and I had a good experience. The reason it's like, I actually will get better rates uh, with them. Like they get, they're passing down, they're getting better rates obviously because they do it at volume, but they're passing down and making it actually better for me as well in a lot of cases. And just like, I'm kind of lazy with making my own listings and the titles and like doing all the shipping and the dealing with the cancellations and the messaging. Like, I just don't want to do all that stuff. So they, that, they're they kind of taking on all that burden off of me. Um, and, you know, you obviously get paid slower that way. You know, you're having to ship, you wait till they get paid, then you get paid, but it's not, it's not terribly slow. Like I, I'm getting paid fairly quickly. Is it fun watching your auctions end? Um, it is. I actually watched. I tuned into Jeremy's show because I had the I had like the highest dollar um, item in like his. He did a a live stream for the MC Sports Cards one. And I had like the highest dollar one, so I, he had the tab open. And I could see it at the end, like he was getting to it, and it was like counting down. It was pretty exciting, and it had some like some action in the end, and he was getting all excited about it. Nice. I imagine that would be fun, nerve wracking, but a fun experience. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like a four second window where you know you're talking about hundreds or thousands of dollars, you know, be, being in your possession or not. Exactly. I enjoy the process of uh, putting up fixed price items on eBay and selling them myself. Yeah, and sort of the routine, like packaging them, going to the post office and stuff. But I've seen multiple instances in this particular cycle of me selling cards over the last three to four months, multiple times where a card that I sold at fixed price that was not getting very strong offers, turning around and being sent to auction and going for like four times <laughs> what the offers were. I think like we are in an environment where the auction setting is beneficial to stronger prices, stronger prices realized than the fixed price setting. I mean, I had instances where somebody would be running the same card as the one I'm selling and granted my eBay page is, you know, completely off the map and irrelevant, doesn't have followers or anything, just has my few little dinky cards. But I would have situations where an identical card to mine would be running at auction and it would be going for more money than my listing. So, yeah. So, 
that happened with a with a few Christian McCaffrey cups. But I don't know. I think that part of it is a little overrated. That like someone has a big eBay store and someone has a small one. It might increase the confidence in someone bidding, but it doesn't increase the discoverability of it because eBay is still like a a fair platform where people are searching out items, and so like your item will show up higher or lower based on the sort algorithm. Like you have a higher list price, so if yours is higher, you know, you're sorting by high price, you'll just show up first. So I'm not as concerned with that part of it. Uh, it's mostly like the convenience for me. Yeah, no, here's where it is a concern. Like if you're talking about Michael Jordan, LeBron James, the big name players or really big name cards, people are actively searching that stuff all the time and you'll be fine. But if you're talking about a Christian McCaffrey or a more obscure player, the people aren't going out of their way to search that player, but lots of people are like looking at what are MC's new auctions, sure. listed? what are you know Probeson's new auctions, and and it puts those cards, those like fringe player cards, who like people might be interested in if there's nothing else competing for their dollars, but they have to have it put in front of them in order to be aware of it. I think it does matter yeah. for that category of cards. And MC had he was running the Kobe White Nebula, which is cool because. Because Kobe White is playing really well right now with Zach Levine hurt, and he's just like having his moment where he's he has actually has like really nice stats, and it's like wow, you know, a pretty big one of one, maybe like a top five Kobe White card is coming up, and it was a part of his sort of like Monday, I don't know what he calls it exactly, but like it was ending with with some focus on it, where it was like ending without any other cards ending within a minute of it, you know, it had its own shine, whereas a Kobe White collector with a small eBay store has that posted best offer. It's kind of just going to sit there, you know? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Of. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, related to eBay, Kevin M. Cormier says, let's just talk a little bit about the AI descriptions on eBay. Do you know? Well, that's a thing. Well, yeah. I mean, if you're listening on eBay, you have the option to say, have AI generate the description for this item. And then it just takes the information that you've already checked boxes and filled in and puts it into a paragraph form. And then yeah. Kevin says, is this useless or super useless? <laughs> and I see a lot of people using this. And look, if you're listing, like eBay requires you to put a description. And if you're listing a bunch of cards, I can see this being a nice little shortcut. But I know myself when I'm listing cards, if I'm feeling lazy, I'll push that AI button. But if I'm not feeling lazy, I'll take the time to put a little sentence together that says something meaningful to the buyer. And the thing that I like to put is I like to let people know I carefully package your card yeah. and I ship fast. And that's why I put in the description. Hey, if you, you know, these are my standards as a seller. I'm going to carefully package this. I'm going to ship it fast. Um, so like when I see somebody using an AI description, I can't help but think to myself, well, what was my mindset when I was using AI descriptions? And it was just me kind of being a bump. <laughs> so not caring about my listing. This, the AI ones, I'm thinking of like the golden and PWCC listings where it's like LeBron is a freight train and he's just like an unstoppable force. Back in 2003 when he was a rookie, he burst onto the scene. It's like, what does any of this have to do with the card? Like you're just talking about the player. I, I personally look for what you said where it's like, how fast are you going to ship this thing? I already know. I'm here to buy the card. I already know the details of it. I see it in the title. I don't need to know like your background of like the player. I can look up that on Basketball Reference. What are you, you as a seller going to provide me? Definitely. All right. Uh, from uh, Sasha P. Cards, if curating a set or collection adds value, why does it? it bring a premium at auction curating a set that adds value well it adds value to you because it's your collection so it might not necessarily add value to anyone else and for, and and like a lot of people already have started their own collections so they want to piece it together themselves with buying the singles and the individuals they don't want the shortcut of just like buying the whole set like it actually is less fun that way yeah definitely um I think that that covers it nicely. I just want to pile on and <laughs> and plant my flag as the uh, anti curator. 
anti cure. Oh my gosh, this is an anti Publius thing. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I am. Uh, I am beckoning the pendulum of cure on on the hype of curation to swing the other way. Let's let's bring back how important curating is because when curating replaces uh when curating supplants the objective status of cards in the hobby community so like if somebody says you know oh this guy has a uh you know a josh allen prison black one of one rookie but he doesn't have a psa 5.5 of 20 of his base cards like me so i curated um, at that point, the pendulum has swung too far, and we have reached a level where we're giving ourselves participation trophies, and we're not being true to the principles of what make cards collectible and desirable. So, so that's where I stand on the curation topic right now. Yeah, the curation, <laughs> the, the curation, like the definition of it, the way I think about it is like. I'm going after cards that I know are important to the hobby. They're aesthetically enjoyable for me. The curation part is like how I choose to sort of like finagle it for myself as I'm doing that. Like, for example, I'm going after like a specific set of all the golds, LeBrons, because I want to have all the important ones checked off and I want to have all the important exquisites, my favorite looking ones. After that, I want them in like PSA. Slabs. I want them all to like look, you know. Uh, I want it to look organized in my collection. I want to have it like categorized in my in my card ladder collection. I want it to be like a certain way. That's the curation part to me. Is like how do I make it for myself after I've sort of followed the rules and the standards of what the hobby is. Yeah, that's a really good point. And then it, it made me think this. It made it made me think that there's there's probably a level of self hatred going on with me where. <laughs> I don't want the stench of me on these cards at all. Like, even when I tried to put sets together, it, it ended up bothering me because it's like, I, I don't, it just, it had too much of me in it. And as much as I like cards as an expressive act, I'm all about the individual card and what the card stands for, not what I bring to the card, sure. you know, or so on and so forth. Like, um, you know, I, 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 if even when I sell a card, I don't want any. I want the next person who takes that card to not have to have anything to do with me. But instead, you know, they take the card because it's just a great card, and I was a steward of it for a period of time. But it is not me adding anything to this card. It's the card adding something to me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it probably just stems from a level of self hatred that's higher than most. So, <laughs> I don't know if pause that. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Where, where else do we go? Oh, all right. Uh, Prison Mike PC says, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what makes a nicely curated team collection. My personal collection begins with the teams that I'm a fan of, and then it goes deeper into specific players from those teams. And it's often easy to lose focus as a team collector due to the large amount of players or nostalgic moments throughout the course of history for the team that one follows. We talk about card limits, focusing on grails, focus on players, but could and should these rules apply to team collectors as well? I welcome the discussion and different viewpoints. The team, team one is hard because <clears throat> players change teams, obviously, and that, that becomes difficult. Like, So if you're going to do the, the team thing, I feel like your focus should be on sort of like capturing and snapshotting the years that you enjoyed watching that team. Like, you know, if I'm thinking of the Suns, like having Steve Nash and Amari to have like the memories of those seven seconds or less teams and like encapsulating that that moment not necessarily worrying about having not try, 
trying to like focus on the prospects of your players, you know, like not, not like getting bogged down and, Oh, I've got to have the, the rookie, like the second they come out and like, I gotta, I gotta get all in on this rookie. It's more like the past of the team and nostalgia. Exactly. Like here's one way similar to what you just described that uh, nuggets collector 1023 does it. I know him. So I'm, I've seen him build a team collection. He's a nuggets team collector. <coughs> he went and got the prison blacks of the players from the Nuggets championship year or the Nebulas. So he went and got a prison black of Bruce Brown in his Nuggets uniform. And then he has a Jokic Nebula. He has Aaron Gordon, Prism Nebula, Jeff Green, Prism Nebula, all in Nuggets uniforms. So that's how he did it. He went and celebrated his team, his the championship, the first ever championship Denver team by going and getting really nice cards that he likes of the players on that team in their in that particular team uniform because now Bruce Brown and Jeff Green are on different teams, and they previously were on different teams. So it was really important to him to go get cards of those players in their team's uniforms. So that's that's a way to do it, similar to what uh, you were saying there. Um, what about the idea of like applying the same criteria? You know, of like, hey, like, I love uh, top uh, top's finest goals. So, like, mm. is it does it still make sense to just say I want to put together a top finest gold run of my whole team PC as opposed to just a player PC? I was thinking that plus, like, because I like like the uh, top finest run uh, of the LeBrons that I have, it would be cool to have like the best rookie from the rookie class of that year. So like, for example, I have a 2007 finest gold LeBron. It'd be cool to have a Durant 2007 because he was the best rookie from that class. And then 2006, picking my favorite rookie. It's similar to like that Nuggets thing you just showed where it's like, you're just sort of celebrating the set or you're celebrating the team accomplishment, the celebration of that. And you're just like, let me just go get like the coolest, most well-known rookie from that as well. Uh, I th- I think it would be very frustrating to try and like get all the prison golds of like your full team from the same year, you know, yeah. stuff, stuff like that could be like really annoying. Like, and I know people like do that. They they set out to to collect in that fashion, and to me, it would just be it's it's, it's going to be really hard to be able to do that. But people do it, so like. Obviously, I'm in touch with Nuggets, some Nuggets collectors. This is Mind Cycle, another Nuggets collector. And he put together what he calls right here 2015 Prism Gold Nuggets partial team set. He still needs the J.J. Hickson to complete <laughs> the team set. Yeah, that's, what, that's what been my issue with set collecting is like now my life is centered around finding a J.J. Hickson card right. when I've never rooted for that player. I don't know anything about them. Or like the green PMGs. You're basically like, I'm about to fork over ten thousand dollars for Olden Polonies. It's just like, what am I doing? Robert Pack is, is my new favorite player because I have like he's Nat Smith, Robert Pack. Like right. he now has to like Robert Pack. Right. Yeah. Or, or in Christina's case, for Rainbow Builders, you have to just like hope and pray that a neon green out of five is gonna surface at some point. Right. Which is not a card that. She would go out of her way to collect, but for its membership in the 2020 Prism Rainbow. Right. All right. Uh, let's go to this question from Publius as we wrap up here. Publius says the Atlanta Hawks scored 116 points tonight, and they still lost by nearly 40. Has the Scoring this season affected your ability to enjoy watching games? And are you at all concerned about individual players juiced up box stats for historical purposes? Did you listen to the Simmons Zach Lowe league pass rankings? Briefly. I I, I caught half of it. I yeah, they they talked about this a little bit, like they were talking about how like the easy answer would be the Pacers with Zach Lowe pushback, and he's like, he's like, it's a little much, like having too much scoring. Like I get that scoring is what you're attracted to, but like I like to watch a little bit of resistance, and so 
I think this was kind of the topic they were going on. And, um, I don't know. I just feel like these teams are just – I think also they, they were t- talking about, like, teams aren't trying to be bad at defense. It's not like they're freaking standing there and just, like, standing in cement. Like, the all-star games you watch, and they're literally not trying. Like, you could tell. These guys are trying. It's just that the offenses are ahead right now, and the rules are kind of bent towards the offenses. Yeah. Uh, I'm not here for this Clint Eastwood routine from Publius. I know what he's doing. He's trying to defend Kevin Garnett's stats. And Garnett played in a very low-scoring era. And he's afraid that uh, Garnett's stats are going to be surpassed by modern players. And I'm going to relieve him of that concern for a number of reasons. Number one, we have advanced stats. And advanced stats, like player efficiency rating, box plus minus, win shares per 48, they are all adjusted to league average. That so if a player like Joel Embiid has a PER this year of 34.1, which is phenomenal, that is relative to league average. Right, it's like a bell curve. Yes, exactly. It's standardized. It's for this season. So we can deal with the juiced up box score numbers among casuals, but um, when we actually look at it, we can use reference points like those. We can look at, you know, a player's true shooting percentage relative to league average and stuff like that, and then we can – that helps us make the comparisons – because we're able to say how much better a player was relative to their peers. We can even do it with teams. The net ratings, per, they're per 100 possessions. They're just normalized, so we can compare yes. a team's offensive efficiency now versus yep. the 90s. Yes, and there's always going to be uh, changes in the game. Like, Michael Jordan played basketball without a three-point line for part of his career. The, the things, massive shifts have happened over the course of the history of the sport. That's a rule change, but there also are aspects of just the way the game itself is played. Will Chamberlain, in a single season, averaged more than 48 minutes per game? <laughs> Load management. Some people might say, Say, how is that possible? It's because not only did he play every minute of every game, but some of the games went to overtime. And that's how he averaged. There is 48 minutes in an NBA game, and he averaged 48.5 minutes per game for all season. All right? And then he – and Will Chamberlain, for his career, 23 rebounds a game. No one's ever going to do that. I don't know. Maybe they will, but it seems very unlikely players today they play like 33 34 35 minutes they're more efficient though the space in the game the game changes the game evolves now to the aesthetic question of how do we like it i love it i love watching the nba today i love the skill that's demonstrated in shooting i love how much teams score i love watching a game that comes down to the final possession knowing that the chance of the of the team being able to score and tie or overtake the other team is more than ten percent. There's a there's a good chance, there's a decent chance that the team's going to score. Whereas in earlier iterations of basketball, there was a such a low chance, such a low low chance that on any given possession, especially in any game of possession, the team would score. You know, if you're watching a '90s game and the score is 63 to 62, and it's the Pistons against the Pacers and the Pistons are down one and they have the ball with 10 seconds left, they ain't scoring. Yeah. There's no drama yeah. there. These, this team put up 62 points over 48 minutes. They're not scoring on this final possession. I hate that. <laughs> that, that brand of basketball, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not what I like. I love seeing scoring highlighted. I think it's awesome. And then I love watching – offenses that are centered around one hyper-talented player. I love that, too. I love seeing one player just dominate a game and do incredible things, which, like, is a relatively new advent, too. I think, like, LeBron is the modern torchbearer of that, but then other players created derivatives of it, whether it's the Harden version of it or the Giannis 
first version of it, so on and so forth. I enjoy that brand of basketball a lot. That's what I say to you, Publius. The only, uh, I agree with all that. The only thing that turns me off aesthetically is, like, I'm thinking of Joel and B where it's like the free throw hunting thing and like the refs kind of have this thing where they they just like don't know what to do with a specific thing so they just lean towards the foul like the Harden thing where he used to hook I was like oh my god I have to sit here and pause and wait for free throws and then like the Trey Young thing they've broken a lot of those with the rules changes which is good uh, but I have tried to watch Sixers games and it's like how many times is this guy just gonna like run into people and get a foul and uh, it's 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 much less frequent than it was a couple of years ago so i'm nitpicking but that's probably the last the last thing that annoys me great point yep good nitpick another thing like kind of related to that is like offensive players are allowed to initiate and get away with so much contact yeah it kind of becomes a farce of like when does the defender have the right to give a little resistance so i'm, I'm I'm with you on that. That is the free throw, the foul baiting, the free throw, excessive free throw shooting. It's that. That is a problem. The scoring is up. Sorry, go ahead. She just she just said the flopping. <laughs> they they uh, honestly like the rule change with the flopping and technical was awesome. Like yeah, there's much less flopping this year. I feel, and then like the obviously the uh, the rule last year where they got rid of the uh, the take fouls like all. All that stuff has helped. I feel like the NBA is really quick to really quick to get rid of those sh- shitty things. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, did you see the, the Steve Kerr uh, face of disapproval? Okay. All right. Yeah, and then Jokic ripped his heart out last night just to Steve cram it on him some more. And, you know, I I don't wonder about. Why Michael Jordan punches guy in the face anymore? <laughs> he, this was Bill Simmons' take on this, which I was laughing about. He's like, I want to be the new Popovich. Steve, Steve Kerr is like, I see the ball, <laughs> it's red taking. You know, Popovich is fading away. I'm gonna take the new curmudgeon of the NBA and just be the next Popovich. Steve Kerr is going for that mantle of just like being the get off my lawn guy, hating all the new stuff. It, it's just ironic to me though that he's complaining about this, this stuff, and it's like, how do you think people felt? When the Warriors started changing everything and dominating everybody, you think they liked just getting crushed by you every game? I think uh, payback's a bitch, Steve Kerr. <laughs> well, I'd ask, Josh, have you been at a Suns game? This question came in to me. Uh, have you been at a Suns game where the Suns DJ has remixed the Steve Kerr complaining that the Suns arena is too loud? <laughs> yes, I went to the Wizards. Okay. Well, don't you find it hilarious that the Warriors literally built an arena so that the fans would make the most noise? Like, they literally used sound engineering to make it so that it's the loudest arena in the NBA when fans scream. And this guy is complaining <laughs> about music in someone else's arena. Yeah, it's just, uh, uh, it's probably not a coincidence that. He's complaining more because they suck and they're not out of the playoffs right now. So cry about it, Steve Kerr. Cry about it. Can I just give a little narration of this? All right, let me just do this. I need to get this off my chest. All right, so so here, like, Pajemski, like, flails his arm up and Jokic jumps over it. And look at this. Look at Oh, man, come on, man. What are you doing, there, man? Oh, come on, man. What? What? That's not part of the game, man. Come on, man. Look at this. What is he doing? Why? He what the face is just that that must have been what Michael Jordan saw in his look five seconds before he punched him in the face. <laughs> what is he, he complaining about? He thinks he's flopping. Doesn't Pajemski flop when he throws his arm up? Uh, that face, though, I'll never forget it, Steve Kerr. I'm just thinking. Team, thinking like when Team MJ punch when Jokic hits that half, almost half court shot, win the game. He's probably just looking over at Steve like, <laughs> was that lo- lucky, Steve? Was that a lucky shot? Or maybe Steve? No, oh, was that lucky? After the game, Kerr said, uh, Kerr said the shot of the game was some other 
a Peyton Watson three. <laughs> Maybe he, he, he has a beat. He has a problem with yoga. Maybe if Clay Thompson scored more than like six points, they win some of these games. You know, <laughs> that dude is uh, not aging gracefully. Just, just go away, Clay Thompson. You're done. <laughs> well, the, Steve Kerr had a conversation with him, but basically said it's okay to suck in the last phase of your career. Wow, that's uh, that's really showing up in the standings. It's good for the team to just let a guy just sit there and kill your team. It's great, it's smart. <laughs> Uh, I know I can count on you hating the Warriors. Clay Thompson, especially. That guy fucking annoys the shit out of me. He's just, like, waving his little forefingers. Like, yeah, it must be nice being the fourth best player on all these teams, bud. <laughs> You're just riding all these coattails. Good job. He's, like, talking shit to LeBron. It's like, dude, you do, like, a tenth as much as him in these finals. Shut your mouth. <laughs> you have, like, like, six dribbles in the whole finals. Good job. <laughs> wow. That's great. All right. Should we Pick a title. Sure. All right. Um, first up, we have Let's Take Some Lumps. <laughs> which we did. Is that, how you, that how you started? Oh, yeah. Like the load management. Yes. Uh, rest, not rust. Uh, polite waiting period. A better way to lose money. Mm. Mm. Purge is good. <laughs> that one out of context is weird. Um, garage sale lexicon. <laughs> uh, damn. My writing is really sloppy today. Something your dollar a little bit more? Stretching. Stretching. Stretching your dollar a little bit more. Uh, let's have a boring 2024. I like that one. I like that one so far. Trust but verify. Attributed, to, attributed to Gandhi. Gan- and you have to write, you have to do like a <laughs> hyphen Gandhi. Just like everybody. <laughs> So several people in the chat like sincerely were like, actually, that's Reagan. Right. I mean, I don't know how you get from Reagan to Gandhi. I don't know where you made that jump, but I love it. I don't know either. Um, peace, uh, peaceful protest. That's what I say. Sub subreddit world. <laughs> Some people live in a subreddit world, and and interrupt the pump. <laughs> Is there a pump uh, uh, emoji? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, well, there's like a lotion. Strong arm. There's a strong arm and there's a lotion bottle, I think. Oh, God. No. No, there's a pump on the lotion I bottle. Know, but no, not for the lotion. Yeah, that's, uh, that could be something else. I don't know what, but okay. That you're asking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, uh, let's have a boring 2024. Oh, is that it? We, that's, that's all, all I got. I mean, I feel like the last half I just stopped writing them down. I kind of dropped the ball there. Well, this is our dropped first the New Year ball. This is our first of the New Year, so paying in, paying some homage to the 2024 is not a bad thing. Yeah, exactly. I like it. All right, let's have a boring 2024. It is. It's like a cheers. Do the oh, do the cheers. Uh, the little like uh, champagne Beer? glasses. Yeah. Okay. Or the champagne glasses. Or the yeah, the champagne. That's better. Yeah. No, that was Josh that said that, not me. Okay. Like, has anyone ever? That's ever been like, guys, I can't wait for this year to be so <laughs> boring. It's gonna be, it's gonna be boring though. So. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, let's have a boring 2024. Yeah, you know how there's like an up graph and a down graph and there a flat graph? No. Oh. Nope. All right. See you guys next week. See why Card Ladder is the most respected sports card analytics app on the market. We have virtually every card in our system. If the card you are looking for ever sold on one of these platforms, you can find it using Card Ladder's sales history. Easily find recent comps and get a better estimate what your cards are worth. See why Card Ladder is the most trusted and the most reliable sports card analytics app on the market. We know what you want because Card Ladder was created by collectors for collectors. 
Join the innovators, not the imitators. Card Ladder, constantly innovating. Try it for free. See why Card Ladder is the industry leader in sports card data. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. Card Ladder, we're just getting started.